being recorded. So we'll uh, officially start then. My name is Brooks Mitchell. I'm based out of uh, the Space Science Institute here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, as part of the StarNet project and our NASA at My Library project, we like to put these um, uh, these webinars on for you all. And I want to go ahead and drop in a link, blank, link bank for you guys. So we're going to be referencing a lot of links in this webinar, um, specifically Emma and uh, the other crew, uh, other folk, other presenters will be referencing those links. So in the top right, you should see a link bank, webinar link bank. Um, if you download that, you'll be able to um, access all these files, access all these awesome resources that we'll be talking about. So let me actually put that in a better place. Put that down here. Oh, that's not better. How about right here in the middle, and I'll give you all about 30 seconds to download it before I um, hide it away. That'll work. So, of course, the Star Library Network, that's the slide that's up there. Um, uh, you guys are probably familiar with us. You might get our newsletters. Uh, we are kind of, we like to consider ourselves the online community for librarians that like to do STEM or librarians that want to learn how to do STEM. Um, so it's an online community where librarians can connect. They can talk about what's working, what's not working. We do webinars. Um, we have landing pages with different uh, resources for different events. Um, we have online forums, blog posts, and of course we have our STEM activity clearinghouse, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. I'm going to hide this link bank. It's still going to be in the uh, top right if you need to access it. I believe you can make that pod bigger yourself if you would like. And we'll hide that in just a little bit. Um, so yeah, a lot of professional development resources for you librarians to get you those STEM resources um, to kind of help you feel empowered and, and be the awesome STEM facilitator that we know you uh, you all are. So I just wanted to talk about our upcoming webinars. Um, this is number three in a four-week series. Uh, we wanted to get some webinars in for you all before you jump off to summer reading because I know you all will be very, very busy for summer reading. So next week we are doing a universe of NASA resources. And I believe Emma is actually uh, a guest speaker today. She'll be on that um, webinar next week as well. So it's kind of uh, we're going to have some some of our friends come on and talk about all the cool uh, resources that that could be used in a library setting. And we're taking a couple of I don't want to say a couple of months off because we're going to be traveling around and at conferences and making how-to videos and a ton of other fun stuff. Um, but June and July we're not going to try to have too many uh, webinars because we know that you all will be busy. Um, and in August, we're going to kick back off, um, do an International Observe the Moon Night webinar, a Lights on After School webinar, and a few different other offerings for you all in the fall. So really exciting stuff. And then, um, let's see, in the top right of your toolbar, you might be able to raise your hand. Uh, is anybody attending ALA this year? So you can click on the raise your hand, or you can just type in the chat box, yes, I am. Kelly, and I see you're attending ALA. That's great, because we have a session together. I hope you are. <laughs> All right. Well, if you are attending ALA, there's a ton of fun stuff. Starnet will definitely be there in full force. Um, we're going to be at the NASA booth, uh, number 1839. Um, and we will be having, you know, you can come talk to us and uh, get some free swag, giveaway stuff. Um, but also, we're going to be doing Hyperwall sessions. So the Hyperwall is this crazy large multiple TV screens. I don't even know how to describe it. You should just Google search NASA Hyperwall. It's very impressive. Um, and so I, my colleague Annie Holland and Kellyanne, will all be giving Hyperwall talks um, throughout the sessions. You can stop by the booth and, and see the full schedule. Um, there's also going to be some other great NASA people there um, giving, you know, talking about their resources as well. And then we have three sessions. Um, Saturday, Saturday, 30 minutes apart. We're going to see how we're going to get to those two. Uh, and then on Monday, June 25th, um, Kelly and our uh, session times haven't changed at all. Are those times still accurate? And so, yeah, come see us. We'd love for you to come to our sessions. We, we promise they're a lot of fun. Uh, we do a lot of hands-on activities. There will likely be cookies because we try to integrate that one way or another. Okay. And, of course, as I talked about our STEM activity clearinghouse, this is our online, um, well, clearinghouse is the word, uh, database of uh, STEM activities that we've kind of, uh, say, curated from across the web um, from, you know, really reliable sources like NASA um, or uh, other, other you know, reliable uh, STEM activity sites. And we've kind of verified that those are good for the library setting. We've uploaded them on the clearinghouse, and we've made them easily sortable for you. So let's say you're like, you know, I need an activity for this weekend. This would never happen because you guys all plan out six months in advance. 
Uh, I need an activity for this weekend that's going to cost me less than $5. It's going to be uh, 40 minutes. It's going to talk about the sun. Well, you can go to the STEM activity clearing house. We have about uh, 150 to 200 activities. You can sort through kind of like, you know, Amazon uh, shopping style. You can sort through those parameters and find the perfect activity for you. We just introduced this new feature on the clearinghouse. Um, it's kind of slowly getting integrated in there. STEM tools. So you might see an activity and think like, okay, they say this is cheap, but I see in the activity write-up they suggest using a microscope. Um, so we don't want to put, you know, that's a $100 activity because it's not if you already have that infrastructure in place if you have a microscope. Um, or if, you know, we think, hey, you could really spice this activity up by using something like an infrared thermometer, uh, which are actually pretty cheap. They're about 10 or 15 bucks. Um, we would put that in the STEM tools and then the add a tech twist function down at the bottom. Um, so just kind of, you know, something to look at if you go to the clearing house a lot. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to mention the Parker Solar Pro Blotch. We did a webinar about this, uh, gosh, two or three, two weeks, two weeks ago. Uh, it was a really, really fun webinar. Our colleague Paul Dusenberry jumped on to talk about heliophysics. Um, so I would encourage you to watch that webinar recording. Um, the launch window, July 31st to August 19th. So they have a big launch window in case, you know, uh, bad weather or a variety of other reasons. Um, so that is a chance for you to do some STEM programming at your library. And then we have a specific sun collection. If you're looking, again, to do a program to integrate with the Parker Solar Probe launch, um, you could go to our sun collection and find a, a list of good activities. So I would encourage you to check out some of those links. All right, so I'm ready to um, introduce some of today's speakers. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Emma Marcucci, she is the Education and Outreach Scientist at Space Telescope Science Institute in Maryland, and I believe she's going to be speaking to us first. We also have Philia Rivera, from, uh, she's the Public Engagement Specialist for NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program, um, so she is located at JPL. And then Holly Ryer is the Senior Education Specialist at Space Telescope Science Institute, so she's right in, I think, in the room with Emma, um, and they'll be handing things off to each other today. And they're just going to be talking about um, some different girls steam ahead with NASA resources. I'm just going to turn things over to them uh, in just one moment. And as I mentioned, we'll be doing some screen sharing today. We're kind of trying to be pretty tech savvy, so bear with us. We try to make those transitions seem seamless, but they, uh, you know, it's kind of kind of hard. So um, I'm not going to give too much of a bio on Emma. Um, you know, I just have this up here for the people watching the recording. Um, she did get her PhD in planetary geology from uh, UC Boulder, which is where we're at now. So, you know, somewhat of a connection there. Um, so I'll go ahead and let's see. I see you coming on, Emma. And then do you want to say a few things? Hi. Can everyone hear me or can you hear me? Excellent. All I right. Um, well, I'm very excited to be here. As Brooks mentioned, I am an education and outreach scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute. So that is the organization or institute that operates the Hubble, excuse me, does the science operations for the Hubble Space Telescope and will be the Science and Mission Operations Center for the James Webb Space Telescope when it launches. Um, we are also in, or, and I say we, meaning all of the speakers here today, are part of NASA's universe of learning. So I will see if I can scroll down. There we go. Um, so NASA's universe of learning is a program, an informal education program, that partners with um, JPL, IPAC at Caltech, Sonoma State University, and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Um, and each one of those partners or organizations um, operates a space telescope. So as I mentioned, STSCI does Hubble and James Webb. Um, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory does the Chandra X-ray Space Telescope. JPL does the exoplanet um, telescopes like TESS that just launched. Our friends at Sonoma State do uh, the high energy missions, so Fermi and SWIFT. And then our folks, um, or our friends at Caltech IPAC do the Spitzer Space Telescope. So these organizations came together to put together a program to um, support informal learning in astronomy and astrophysics. Um, you'll see our mission statement there on the slide. Learners of all ages and backgrounds are engaged and immersed in exploring the universe for themselves. Um, so today we're going to talk about Girls Steam Ahead with NASA. Uh, as the, the webinar that Brooks mentioned, the, as the NASA, uh, Universe of NASA Resources, which I'll be on next week, we'll talk um, a little bit about Girls Steam Ahead, but then also talk about some of our broader portfolio that might be usable in your library. 
So Girl Steam Ahead is uh, an initiative where we partner with libraries and some other community-based organizations to engage girls and their families in STEM. Um, and our goals in this partnership are to provide um, exhibits, posters, programming, hands-on resources related to NASA astrophysics content um, that can be used kind of throughout a, a range of audiences. Um, we, and I'm going to just jump right in here because we have a lot to cover. So one of the resources um, that we have, we kind of break them down into three different types. Um, and the first one I'll mention is SME or subject matter expert involvement. Um, and so this is scientists, engineers, um, educators, uh, people, particularly the NASA scientists and engineers, who have a direct connection to the science. Um, they work directly on missions. They work with the data. And um, there's many of those SMEs, or those experts, on our team. And we also have connections to a lot of the missions. So if you were interested in having a virtual um, or sometimes in person, that I have to put the caveat out there that there are select locations where we can do in-person um, uh, events. But if you wanted to have your audience uh, talk, have a conversation with a, an engineer, have a conversation with a scientist, or perhaps have that scientist call in and walk, walk your group through some of these activities that we'll talk about later, that is a possibility. Um, we can do that uh, kind of through Zoom, through Adobe Connect, through different platforms to have that discussion. So and the next type of resource that I want to mention, and I'm going to go through the general overview pretty quickly so that we have time to get into more detail of a few of these specific ones. Um, we have a number of exhibits and posters, and you'll see them listed here. This is a collection from all of those partners that I mentioned. Um, the exhibits tend to be, um, the they, they can be a physical like pull-up banner, kind of like you can see the young girl um, looking at. We also have all of these exhibits as PDF. Um, so they're online and they can be downloaded and self-printed. The different exhibits have different rotation schedules or different um, requirements. Uh, so if you're interested in any of these, um, I'll show you our website link uh, towards the end here. Uh, you, there's more information and links to all of the exhibit details on there, on our website. Um, we also have poster series. Um, so the Women in STEM poster series, some of you may have seen before, that um, is uh, um, also available in Spanish now. And they come in uh, kind of poster size. So I think it's about 11 by 16, as well as postcard size. Um, and we also have the Women of Color uh, poster. That's just a single poster and the exoplanet travel posters, which I believe the next speaker will probably talk a little bit about. Um, again, those are all available for downloading and printing. We do have a limited number of copies available if you are doing an event and would like to use them in the event. We um, have the ability to send you a hard copy. Um, and to our next one. So this is an, uh, an overview of all of the STEM activities that we currently have on our website. And our intention is to continue building this. Um, so we especially like to hear what you like, um, what you could use in your library so that we can continue to build this, this resource. Um, and we try to have activities that are both computer-based as well as uh, kind of paper and pen or, or, or non-computer-based based on um, what resources your library might have. Um, so the on the paper and pen side, we have an activity called Recoloring the Universe, and that's that neon kind of orange-green um, pamphlet. And uh, that actually has a directly correlated Recoloring the Universe computer-based activity. Um, and the point of this activity is to describe or help help youth start to understand how spacecraft um, collect data and how that data is processed and ultimately made into images. Goes a little bit into how, a, how an image is made, so kind of like the red, green, blue color channels. Um, the Recoloring the Universe is a really nice, has a just introductory coding information in it. Uh, it's a coding module that the participant can then manipulate and see how that changes things. 
there are really nice videos. Um, we're not going to go into detail on that one today, but there are videos um, that go through, uh, that walk you through each step of that. Um, we are going to um, look at the scale models and the binary activities um, today in a little bit, so we'll go over there though, then. For the tactile universe, these are the kind of white and black image. These are thermally printed uh, astronomical images that have um, some topography to them. So if you work with communities um, that ha are slight limited, these might be a good resource for them to explore. They're able to see with their hands what an image looks like. Um, and again, we do have some hard copies of those, as well as the, the um, source files themselves are online. Um, on the computer-based side, we'll be going into microobservatory. This is uh, or observing with NASA. These are a series of uh, robotic telescopes that uh, you can actually manipulate, take images from, and then process the data for. Uh, the universe in 3D it starts working in uh, Tinkercad, so it's actually looking at spatial relationships and building modules um, within the Tinkercad framework. And then Eyes on Exoplanets and Exoplanet Travel Bureau, we're going to hear a little bit about um, in more detail. So I'm going to just jump to this next page. So um, this, uh, these are the resources that we're going to go over today in like the next 20 or so minutes. Um, and uh, all of these links are in that link bank that Brooks uh, shared earlier, and they're, all, they're also on the slide. And for this section, I am going to pass it off to my colleague at JPL. Thalia Rivera is going to um, introduce the first set of activities. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay, so hi, my name is Celia Rivera, and I am the Public Engagement Specialist for NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program. Uh, so I uh, work on events, coordinating events like our open house. Um, I do scientific conferences. I develop products um, such as the travel posters, and I um, participate in events, uh, public events, and I get to talk to the public about exoplanet science. So I'm just going to launch into um, some of the products that we have here at the Exoplanet Exploration Program. Uh, so this one right here that I'm talking about is the Exoplanet Travel Bureau, and I have some screenshots, um, as you can see on the slide. So this is available on our website. So that's exoplanets.nasa.gov. And what this is, is this is a fun tool to use to get people um, interested and um, engaged with exoplanet science. And this specifically shows people what exoplanets, um, or what we imagine exoplanets could possibly look like. So we have our travel posters here that are available for download, and they are in different files, and they are all at uh, print resolution. And then we also have our VR here, um, and that is a 360 version of our VR, and it's also the stereoscopic view. So if you have like a Google Cardboard headset, you can pop in your phone, um, and then you can look around, and it's really great with kids. Um, and this is what we usually take to our conferences. So that um, is a really great way to get people started on exoplanet science. And the next product that we have here is our Eyes on Exoplanets app. And what this is, is it is a 3D rendered universe, and you can explore this universe and see exoplanets in 3D. And you can see some really cool features. So if I figure out how to share my screen, I am going to Give me one moment to share my screen. And Thalia, um, or Thalia, would you mind um, speaking just a little bit more into the microphone on your? Mm -hmm. Can everyone? Perfect. Hear? Thank you. Let's 
Okay, so I can't tell if everyone can see this because. Oh, okay. okay. Yes, we can. It's coming in clear. Guys on Exoplanets app. Um, this is the uh, I guess start page, and if you see how I hover over each of these stars, um, you can click on any one of these, and it'll take you directly to a star system. And you see that we have the planetary system view, where you can view. Um, the star system and its planets. You can see how long it would take to travel there. So you can click automobile and it would take you 1 billion years, light speed, um, and it would take you 111 years. You can also see where the habitable zone of any given star is, um, which is really neat when you're teaching people about the habitable zone, um, where liquid water can survive and how it differs um, with different stars. And then you can also compare it to our system. So this system right here is being compared to our system, if you can see it. So there's Earth right there, there's Mercury, there's Venus. And you can see that this has a very, this planet specifically has a very wide orbit. So you can also see what some of the latest discoveries are. Um, so this app, uh, collects data or draws data directly from the from NASA's Exoplanet Archive, um, and it updates every time we find a new exoplanet. So you have a 3D model of what this exoplanet looks like and what its star looks like. We also have some really uh, fun tools in here. So there's this one called Weirdest Planets, which is my personal favorite. And you get to see some of the weirdest planets that we've discovered. And this is especially great with kids um, when you want to get them interested in different planets. So you see that this planet right here is a massive planet, um, but we call it the styrofoam planet because it would be able to float on water and it's not a very dense planet. And if you go back to the planet, you can go to the next planet. Uh, this one is an egg-shaped planet because this planet is being eaten alive by its star. And then we also have some discoveries here from our Kepler Space Telescope. So you can click on any one of these stars again, and it would take you directly to that star system. And then we have confirmed planets, the planets that we know that exist. And then we have the candidates. So these are planets that we think exist, but we have not confirmed them yet. And then you can see both. So if you are talking about a specific planet um, and you want to go to it, so for example, I want to go to Kepler 16b, which is a planet with two suns. I would just type that into the search engine. I could go to the star or I could go to the planet. And then it would take you directly there so you can see what the planet looks like. It gives you some information about the planet. You can compare it with our solar system. And then you can compare the size. So you can see how big it is compared to Earth. Um, and this is really great when you're talking about scale. And you can see how big it is compared to Jupiter. And then we also have our exoplanet missions here. So here at uh, JPL, we have the Exoplanet Exploration Program. Um, and we do a lot of the science that comes from the data that we collect through all of these missions. The Kepler has provided the most data for us so far. And you can see what the telescope looks like. You can compare the size of the telescope to a scientist or a school bus. Um, that's how big it is. And then it gives you a bit of information about that telescope when it launched, um, some of the discoveries that it has made. So this is the most recent mission. And this is TESS, which is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And you can also compare the size to that as well. And then right here, you just have the settings. Um, if you want to show a grid or not show labels, you can show the entire star fold or you can't. You can raise the brightness of the stars. Um, and it's just a really neat tool that lets you see and imagine what some of these exoplanet systems may look like. And again, we update this. Um, with every new exoplanet that we find. So right here is the planet count, uh, stars with planets, 
in Earth-like planets, which so far we have not found any. So let me close that. And I'm not too sure how to stop sharing my screen. So Brooks, if you'd like to. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll jump in here and uh, Rick, I'll pull it over here. Um, so bottom right, you should see the. Um, are you back on? Yeah, I don't have it. I don't have that little screen. Okay. There we go. Oh, that's okay. Um, do you have so, any? All right. Sharing and there. <laughs> Great. So I, um, from here, I believe we're going to turn it back to Emma yes. just for a moment. Um, so back to me, and I am also going to share my screen. So give me one moment while... All right. So um, let's see if I can... Brooks, can you pull that over into the viewable section? I don't think I have control anymore. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, you're good so to go. I wanted to talk uh, about a few other resources yeah. that we have. Um, uh, so the first one I want to talk about is Microobservatory. So if you go to microobservatory.org, um, you'll come to this splash page. Um, there's a couple other websites that will get you to the same place. But we're going to start with this DIY planet search, um, since this is applicable to the information that Belia was just talking about, if you want to kind of take the next step um, and actually collect some data or your students want to collect some data and process it themselves, you can actually click on this uh, portal. And I'm actually going to flip over to the one that I've already signed into. Um, so this is a login, but anyone can sign in. And it looks like it's taking a little bit of time to load there. Oh, and great, I'm already logged in. Um, when you have this, um, you will, um, uh, so you can, when you first sign into it, you'll have a chance to actually create an account. And then you can cr use this account to collect images. This is the home page. And basically what this is, this is a series of robotic telescopes. Here's a kind of a tiny picture of one. And you can request that this telescope take an image. So this, this uh, weekly schedule of targets has various um, exoplanets that these telescopes are able to collect data from. So if you go over, let's go to one. So if we wanted to say on Thursday, I want to collect data, you would go over here. You, col you click the planet that you want. Usually, it's a good idea to click all hours or all times um, so that you get all a, a full data curve. Um, and then you, the um, suggested settings will be preset, but you can also play with those and see how different settings um, work. Um, and this video tutorial up here, telescope tutorial, will uh, walk you through all of this as well, because I'll go through it pretty quickly. And then you just click Take Image. And basically, so it says image was requested. So on Thursday night, that image will be taken. I can then sign back in. And you can see up here, I now have this new. So it'll tell me that I have pending one image. Um, in the past, I've collected these four. Um, and the nice thing about uh, DIY Planet Search is that you can also have groups. Um, so if you had a group of students, um, and now because this is night to night, um, you either have to plan ahead of time or maybe it's an activity that students can kind of, or excuse me, that youth can take home um, and work with on their own. Um, you can create groups. So you could say, I want my STEM club to all be in the same group. And then they can actually jointly work on these images. And you'll see why that's important. If I go to data, and I'm going to say analyze images, you can see the different stars and, um, that I have taken data from. And if you scroll all the way down here, you'll see this cutter one has a check mark next to it. 
that means that I have collected this data. Um, if it doesn't have a check mark, excuse me, that I've processed that data. If it doesn't, then it means that it's, well, it's taking a long time to load. <laughs> um, it means that I haven't actually processed it yet. Um, and you process this information. Sorry, this is got the little spinny wheel. Um, I know they were having, so again, in this kind of box back here that you can kind of see the brightness tutorial and star finding, this will talk, this will walk you through how to process these images. Um, all right, let me see if I can switch to this one, see if that'll work better. Um, Well, so um, what this is, is it'll bring up a star field. So it'll be a mostly black, it'll be a completely black and white image, lots of black sky with these stars. And ah, here we go. So it's going to walk you through how to find this. Um, so the first thing that you would do is you would calibrate your image, and that's just clicking the button. There's um, some processing in the background that does that for you. And then it wants you to select a target star, the two comparison stars, and then dark sides. And these numbers are then used to calculate the apparent or the brightness. Um, if you use the finder chart, you'll see that it shows you the pattern of your target star, WASP 39, and your two comparisons. So you need to find that pattern in this star. So it looks like our target star is right here. I think that's about right. Is that right? Um, and you would click on that, get it centered up. And then our comparison star was down here. And I believe it was this one over here. And you can always delete these numbers if you accidentally grab the wrong one. So you click on that. Then you choose two dark areas of the sky. We like to choose them close to the target star. And then you hit cloud calculate and record. It'll take a few seconds, but then you'll see a brightness calculation uh, pop up along here. There you go, brightness measurements. So you can imagine if you have 130 images that it's going to take a while for an individual person to do it, which is why groups are really nice. You can actually work through um, and say, all right, this person's going to take the first five, this person's going to take the next five, or something like that. Um, we're going to skip ahead to viewing the data. So I'm going to scroll down here to one that I've already done. And you'll see that th these are all of your brightness measurements. So you can actually you can export this and graph it on your own. Or you can use this graph brightness um, on within there. And you'll see that the brightness dips down at about 1.45 or 2 o'clock in the morning in Arizona and then pulls back up. So this is your graph. Um, you can also look at the components and the altitude. So this is that if the star was setting or rising. Um, and then this is um, how those different star, or excuse me, how those different targets were comparing. Um, and so you can, you want to see this V or this U shape. That indicates that the sun, that the planet has moved in front of the star, blocked out just a little bit of light, and then um, transits across it. You can see um, how your how your data compares to other data. So this is interpreting your results, and then you can say this is the predicted trend. Um, and you can look at the community results all over the world. You can click on a person, or you can select by target, and you can see how your data correlates to other people's data. So this is a really nice uh, activity to really get um, uh, youth involved with understanding the data, working with the data themselves. It is um, a pretty big um, step um, in terms of using robotic net or the robotic telescope network. So I would also recommend starting with observing with NASA. So that's this portal on the left side. And this is using those telescopes, but now what it's going to do is um, going to take a picture. So you can control the telescope. So you um, look at all of these targets. And it's going to tell you what is up that night. What could it take a picture of? And then it, you click Observe. So just like before. Um, it'll give you a couple telescope settings. If you choose a wrong setting, it'll say, well, think about that. 
try a different one, and then it'll lead you to the right one. Um, I recommend using multiple filters um, because then you're getting the full image, the color, and you can make a color image. So once you've collected all of those, you hit continue, um, you put in your email address, and then you will get an email the next morning or the next day with those images. Now, if you're having an, an activity that's just um, a single day and maybe you don't have time to um, uh, spend overnight, we also have, they have archived images. Um, so this uh, tutorial, when you click on Analyze Images, this will actually walk you through um, parts of this program. So if you want to go through in more detail than I am today, you can actually just click through these and learn a bit more. Um, I'm going to close this for the time being. But um, so you can you have these archived images, so you don't have to um, you don't have to have a multi-day event. You could do this in a single day. And let's say you want to look at the Lagoon Nebula. So you would upload one of these. Click on here, and it'll get take a second. Let that go. Get tell. Okay, yes, yeah, so I was already on Lagoon. There we go. Um, and this image probably doesn't look very interesting right now. Um, so you, you'll need to adjust these slide bars in order to um, get the most information out. So you look around for a dark part of the sky. You'll look at the pixel value here. Um, and you'll whoop, pull this down. Okay, so that's about as low as it can go. And then you'll look at a bright spot, and you'll kind of pull this down. So you're starting to see this shade right here. You can play around with the contrast, get that shadow to pop up, or the shift bias. Um, and you can do that for each one of these images. You probably noticed that most of these have at least three images. Um, you would do that similar process for each one. Um, and then, and I'm not going to do that for the interest of time, but then you can assign it a color. You can say, I'm going to make this one red, I'm going to go and make this other one green, and then if I open the third one. This works really well with um, middle school and high schoolers, um, aged uh, youth, so depending on um, what, uh, how detailed they get in and how much um, they start working on here. So once you have all of these images, and they're not going to look very good, I apologize, um, you can actually have them, you can go to red, green, blue mode. So they're going to overlay. And you'll see that there's just slightly off center. So you also have this tool called shift. And it's going to shift whatever color is in this uh, color uh, scale down here at the bottom. And you would just click on here, and it's going to very slowly. That is one thing about this is you actually have to manually click. And it actually looks like I want to switch to red. Um, and then you would line those up so that's a little bit better. You can zoom in. Um, so you have a number of tools here. Um, you can zoom in. You can um, sh kind of work with some of these sharpen um, or these different image filters to try to clean things up. And then you will end up with a nice image. Um, I couldn't really do it in just a couple minutes, so I apologize. This is not a hugely clean um, image. But there are also some really good training videos um, and uh, processing information. So I definitely encourage you to explore that. It's really fun. If you then have a printer connected to the computers, you can print those out, and they can take those home. So the last one I want to talk about really quickly is a, not a, not a computer-based um, activity, and that is um, how to talk to a spacecraft. So this gets into understanding how data is collected through a series of ones and zeros, um, and then working that up to understanding how an image is made. So there's a couple examples here. You can write your name in binary. You can make a bracelet or pins, and it's understanding that um, the ones and zeros and how those translate to letters um, or how that um, translates to data that a telescope collects. Um, and then you can do pencil code. Again, this is computer-based or not computer-based to then take that um, to actually make an image themselves. Um, so I know I flew through a lot of information there. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to switch back, stop sharing.
Um, I'm going to switch back to the slides. Yep. And the next, whoops, the next person, let's see if I can click the buttons there now. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Holly Ryer, and she's going to talk a little bit um, about best practices and how you can use some of these resources. Okay, hi everybody. Is my sound okay? Yeah, it's, it's good, Holly. It's a little bit soft, so just make sure to speak up, but um, it's coming through fine talk, on my end. I'm trying to talk loudly here. Uh, as, as Brooks mentioned earlier, I'm a senior education specialist here at Space Telescope, and I work here with Emma Marcucci. And I'm very, very sorry that my head in real life does not look at all like the head you're seeing on the slide, but I am very happy to be here online with you all today. And uh, what I would like to do is share some background about best practices and how this relates to Girl STEAM Ahead activities and events. And I like to call this the good, the bad, and the ugly. So uh, first, uh, let's start with the good. So a little bit about the uh, landscape of women in STEM and what research tells us. And the research tells us that the number of women in STEM has been increasing since the 1990s. That's great news. Uh, girls now are performing as well as or better than boys uh, when it comes to math and science. And this is when you look at both their grades and their test performance and also in their course taking behavior. That's also great news. And uh, the, the last point is a very interesting one because it's contrary to what a lot of research says where they say girls interest in STEM tends to decrease in middle school. And what the Girl Scouts found when they did a national survey in 2013 of middle and high school girls was that 74% of the girls that they surveyed in high school actually were still very interested in math and science. And they discovered that sometimes in research studies, it kind of depends on how you ask the question. And a lot of previous studies would ask girls like, do you want to uh, major in STEM in college or do you want a STEM career? And a lot of times they would say, well, no, or I'm not sure. But if you ask them, do you like math and do you like science? Well, they say yes, which is also great news. Um, but there is still some bad. So even though the number of women in STEM is growing, they are still underrepresented. And for women who do pursue STEM careers, they are much more likely to leave those careers than men are. And, and then, of course, we have the ugly. So this is where we look at, you know, young girls today and, and what some of their thinking is. And while they still have a lot of interest in math and science, they are not always as interested in pursuing that in college or choosing careers in those fields. So this is why things like Girls Steam Ahead is important. Um, and this is why this is also important, increasing the good. So the universe of learning, we are not in a position to always fix the bad or always fix the ugly. But what we really strive to do is increase the good however we can and also help program providers such as yourself increase the good. And the really, really best news of all is that research says that you do. Um, the research says that out of school time STEM experiences are beneficial for boys and girls in supporting their confidence in STEM and promoting their sense of identity as a scientist. So for those libraries that are doing STEM programming, thank you, you, you do make a difference. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what that looks like when we talk about increasing the good. Um, this is a pretty uh, dense slide of text here and a lot of you are probably already familiar with some of these ideas, but the emerging themes that come out in research in terms of best practices for engaging youth is create a low pressure environment. So don't time your tasks, don't create contests, don't set up a situation where groups of students are competing against other groups. Um, being student centered basically means giving students voice and choice in their activities. So you may opt to do several different girls steam ahead activities and let students decide for themselves which one they want to do if you're able to set up different activity areas. Or if you pick a particular activity like the observing with NASA activity where students can pick different images to process, that one's great. That one already has the, the voice and choice built into it for you. Um, emphasizing process and not just product. So it's not about did you get the right answer. It's did you get an answer and tell us how you got it. 
And did other students do it the same way you did, or did they maybe do it differently? And let's talk to each let's talk to each other about how we got those different answers. Um, if possible, um, have students complete activities as a part of cooperative groups or teams. We find that with computer-based activities, if students have to share computers, two to three students per computer is optimal. Um, anything more than that, it's not always a, an optimal experience anymore. Um, gender balance, something else that's very interesting and very counterintuitive that you see sometimes in the research is sometimes it can be a bad thing if you over-focus on the girls, even if it's in a positive way. Um, it kind of singles them out and makes them feel self-conscious. So the key is, is not to focus the event, oh, this is for girls, this is for girls. It's just to be inclusive to them and include them and not do things that are exclusionary. But you don't have to make it all about the girls, which is why with Girls Steam Ahead, we also encourage this, these events to be open to family members and siblings, and boys can be included as well. And then there's, of course, family and parent en encouragement. In the research, the one other thing that makes a difference in terms of student STEM identity and their engagement in STEM other than out-of-school time experiences is support in the home and support for their parents. And a lot of parents want to support their children in STEM but don't always know how or don't know what's available to them. So a great tip would be um, there's, a, there's a document called Summary of Resources. And you may choose to maybe do one activity as part of a Girl Steam Ahead event, but then you could give students that summary of resources to take home with them, or you could give it to family members, and that provides them with lots of great follow-up things that they could do at home on their own time. Uh, okay. I am going to skip ahead very quickly, and I'm just going to point out these two resources for you. Um, uh, all the references for the research that was cited in today's presentation are available to you in the link bank. And some of you might be familiar with these resources as well, but in case you're not, I uh, wanted to point this out, these two resources out to you. These are two great compilations of where you can find strategies for engaging girls in STEM and um, also research and statistics about women in STEM. And this is from Sci Girls 7 and from the National Girls Collaborative. And then I want to take a minute and just share a few more resources that we have here from us here at Universe of Learning that can help you with your events. So I am going to share my screen. Okay, everybody wish me luck with this. <laughs> <laughs> and while she's doing that, um, I'll just say that the slides that Holly kind of stepped through quickly um, have some um, have some of these practices related to the resources that we talked about, and these slides will be available to you afterwards, so you'll be able to um, look at them in detail. Okay, I am looking at the Girl Steam Ahead website. Is everybody else seeing that as well? Hey, Holly, so I'm getting a blue screen. Um, so hit stop sharing, and when you share again, um, share specifically, you can share an application, and you would share that application, uh, whether it's Chrome or Internet Explorer. It's promising. Okay. Is it working better now? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'll Very good. Yep. Okay. So this is the Girls Steam Ahead website. And if you get a chance to visit this site, you can see some navigation here on the side. And you can hit Media Template, Package, and Patch. And this will scroll you down to the bottom of that site page. And you will see here's some nice templates that you can use if you're planning an event and you're trying to get people to sign up, to register, if you want to do announcements, 
if you would like to promote this event to your local media in some way, we have templates to help you with that. We have Girl Steam Ahead patches that you can use for branding your documents, both in color and in black and white. And uh, we also have photo re releases available for you. Um, you may have your own photo releases that you may use for your events. Uh, we would prefer, if possible, if you could use these ones instead. We really, really love it if people want to share their event photos with us and email them to us. But we really need to have the photo release in order to, for them to be usable for us. The other option is we really like photos that don't show uh, students' faces, that don't identify them in a way. So if you're able to get shots from behind or from over the shoulder, those shots are okay without the photo release. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And go back to the slides. And those are all the things we have available that hopefully are really, really helpful for you. And there's two things that I would like to point out that you can do that would be super, super helpful for us. So the first thing is, is if you're interested in doing a Girl Steam Ahead event at some time this year, doesn't have to be next week, next month, it could be at any point in time, we ask you that between now and June 20th to visit this link and complete the interest survey. And this really helps us because this kind of lets us know who you are. It lets us know um, what the needs of your library are. And we follow up with you. And there's lots of other resources we have that may not be included in this presentation. But if we know who you are and that you're interested, we can follow up with you, get more information about your needs, and point you to even more things that can be helpful for your event. So that's the first thing that really helps us. And then the second thing is, is if you do sign up for a Rural Steam Ahead event, we are evaluating this with uh, an external evaluation group called Goodman Research Group. And we just ask you to email us about three weeks before your event and give us the information that you see there in the slides. And you will get a packet of surveys that will come from Goodman Research Group. They won't come from us. And they will give you an envelope that is postage paid and you just have to have the students participating in your event complete those surveys. Uh, you collect them back and just put them off in the mail to Goodman Research Group for us. And that is all that I have. Um, but now we are at 3.55 and we have just a little bit of time left for questions. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Holly. That was, um, I was getting really excited during the good, but knowing that the bad and the ugly were coming along too. So thanks for sharing all that information. Um, and, and for all of you, so now is the time we, yeah, we'll have a few minutes for a Q&A. If you want to put any questions you have in the chat box, uh, and we'll give you a few seconds to do that. As you're putting any questions that you have, I'm going to pull the URLs up one more time. Just for any of you that did not download it. So um, there's a lot of interesting reports and a lot of other good links and resources in those URLs. So or uh, in that link thing. So make sure to download that. Um, while we're waiting on questions, I'll follow up with all of you and send you an email. Um, it probably will, on like Friday after we get the webinar uploaded with all the links and resources from this. So looking, I'm uh, looking at the e uh, sorry chat box. Um, so we have we had successful turnouts at previous Girl Steam Ahead events. So um, in this, uh, Girl Steam Ahead grew out of a program called NASA Science for Girls, or NASA Science for Girls and Their Families, and some of its iterations. And um, that worked a little bit on a local scale. So this is a national scale. Last year we had about, I think, let's see, how much was it? Um, I think there were 80 different events throughout the year. Um, I cannot tell you exactly what the numbers were. I know some of the, some of them were smaller, you know, five to ten people. Some of them were larger, like a uh, hundred people. Um, when you're using our resources and doing our events, um, we're happy to have you incorporate them into existing programming. We're happy to work with you to create a Girls Steam Ahead specific event or if you want to use one of the resources and combine it with something else. Um, so we have people use our resources in a lot of different ways. 
Um, and we, I'd say there's about a third of them that we're able to directly participate in or that um, event coordinators ask us to directly participate in. But then there's also a number of events um, that we um, know about or that we've worked with to help um, provide resources for but haven't actually attended. So I would say yes, we've had good turnout. Um, sorry. All right, Holly, I think there's one for you. <laughs> Oh, is this the question in oh, the yeah, chat just, yeah. about, but about the um, data and references for girls mm -hmm. in STEM? Okay, yes. So, so the references that were specific to this presentation are in the link bank document. There's a section there that I think is called best practices references, and that's where some of this information was pulled from. But we also do keep a full bibliography of research that we're always updating all the time that's related to girls' interest in STEM and also research for the state of women in STEM. And we have that available to share as well. Um, Emma, should we have them email the Girls Steam Ahead account? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think that would be good. It's a, um, you can just email us and we'll get it off to you. Um, and I saw one comment about the coding um, or a coding club and data. Um, so we have some coding activities, the Recoloring the Universe, um, we have uh, Universe of Learning has coding events and there's kind of a nice um, template that they're still working on that walks you from binary into Recoloring the Universe coding into 3D spatial and then eventually maybe a little bit of virtual reality. That part hasn't totally been tagged on yet. Um, we know there's a lot of interest in coding, and so that's something that we're looking to um, increase as well. Yes, and as Vivian pointed out, there are new, um, or I, I, think, I think maybe you're referring to the new ones, maybe not, but there are new Space Science Girl Scout badges coming out this fall. Um, and so there's a lot of really good um, work there and activities there, and certainly they can be connected. Are there any other questions? And really feel free to contact us at, at any time. Um, if you have any questions, please do. You guys um, want, want to put your emails in the chat box? Or, or just a good contact in, uh, email? A couple. <laughs> and I just want to say, um, for those of you, I know we're getting ready to, to wrap things up. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I will end the virtual classroom, um, and then it'll send you to a Survey Monkey link, so you can submit a survey and let us know how wonderful of a job we did. Um, so just before you're quick to exit out, uh, whenever we wrap up, I'll um, end the meeting, and, and it'll send you to that survey. Maybe we'll see if there's any other questions. We'll give you just a little bit. I'm sorry, sorry, Marta. I should have um, given you the time based on your time zone uh, that for the zip code you put in. Uh, this will be recorded, and I'll make sure you get a copy of the recording as well. All right. So I guess on that note, um, Emma and Holly, do you mind if we go ahead and close out? Do you have any? That's good. Um, I'll reiterate um, the interest survey. And really, as Holly said, that's just for us to kind of help make sure we're meeting your needs. It's not a binding contract. It doesn't have to be immediate. You know, if something comes up later and you're, you aren't able to do it, that's fine. It's a, just a way for us to make sure that we're addressing the needs, um, your needs, and providing what you need for your communities and resources. Or yeah. All right, so uh, make sure to come back next week and, um, you know, we'll talk so about some different NASA uh, uh, resources as well. And um, happy summer reading to everybody. Thanks. And we hope to see you soon. Thanks for joining.